All right, we're going to continue on with our intro to biochemistry, and this is the part of this assignment uh, that is going to be dealing with water. And to talk about water, we've got to talk about um, some different sorts of co covalent bonds, which we began to mention in the last podcast. Polar versus nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay? Uh, polarity. Um, obviously, when we talk about polarity, we're implying that something has two different ends or two different poles. Um, much like uh, a magnet has a north pole and a south pole, two opposite ends. Um, and a polar molecule, which is how the term is used in, in biology most of the time, uh, we are talking about uh, two, a molecule that has two ends. Um, and essentially what makes the two ends different is they have a slightly different charge. Uh, one end of the molecule is slightly positive, while one end of the other end of the molecule is slightly negative. Okay? Uh, what causes this is an unequal sharing of electrons, an unequal sharing of electrons. And a nonpolar molecule uh, what is uh, in play is there, there is no difference in one end of the molecule. It is nonpolar. It has no polarity. The electrons are shared equally. It's the same across the length of the molecule, the, the, um, the, the charge. So a nonpolar covalent bond simply means we're, we're sharing electrons equally. Two atoms, for example, this carbon and this hydrogen are sharing these electrons very evenly in this covalent bond. These are the same. That's just different ways to show covalent bonds. The, the electrons are not being pulled any more towards the carbon than they are towards the hydrogen. It's a nice equal. They play nicely in the playground. Uh, they share nicely uh, sharing of the covalent bonds. I mean sharing the electrons to make the covalent bond. Okay. Um, um, such bonds uh, create very balanced, stable, good building blocks, which is one of the reasons that carbon and hydrogen are the fun among the fundamental atoms that make up organic compounds and thus life. Polar covalent bonds are different. In polar covalent bonds, you have unequal sharing of electrons. And the classic example, and the one that you really need to know, is water. Okay. Um, and the whole reason that water and many other uh, covalent bonds are polar is because oxygen does not share its electrons nicely. When it ga engages in covalent bond, oxygen usually has a greater pull for electrons than any other atom, at least, than, that we will come into contact with um, in, in biological realms. Okay, so oxygen loves electrons. Loves electrons. It is very what we call electro negative and that's going to be a very important word that's what oxygen is oxygen is electronegative it loves electrons and even though it's sharing with this hydrogen here and this hydrogen here it is not sharing equally it is keeping the electrons much more often much more of the time toward itself and maybe letting hydrogen see them you know once a day once every other Thursday on days where it's not cloudy. So it's very, very uh, much more keeping those electrons toward itself. Of course, that was just a joke. Clouds would have nothing to do with it, okay? So you need to know that electronegative means uh, an atom loves electrons and pulls them towards itself. And up here, if I hadn't scribbled all over it, you would see here's hydrogen indicating the electrons being pulled from both hydrogens towards the oxygen. And what happens is we end up with a slight negative charge, slightly negative charge around the oxygen. And you can see that indicated by these little funky Greek symbols up here, the slight negative charge, because <clears throat> those electrons, which are negative, are spending more time around the oxygen than they are around the hydrogens. By default, that means it is somewhat 
positive, slightly, slightly positive around the hydrogen end of this water molecule because the electrons are not very often around the hydrogens, okay? So slight positive charge around one end, slight negative charge around the other, and that's what gives this molecule its polarity. Water is a polar molecule. Please note, you need to associate the term electronegative with oxygen. That is just a characteristic of oxygen. Water is not electronegative. Water is polar, okay? And that is due, yes, to the electronegativity of oxygen within the water molecule, but that is what makes water polar, and that means it has two different ends, a negative end and a positive end. Okay, uh, now these negative and positive ends, slight, slight negative and positive ends, and remember it's not ionized, it's still a covalently bound molecule, but uh, these slightly positive and negative ends lead to really important properties of water that make it so uh, pivotal for life on Earth, okay? So, Hydrogen bonding is created due to the polarity of water molecules. All right, so here's where we're going to learn about hydrogen bonding. If you don't remember from chemistry, this is a really important, um, this and covalent bonds are probably the two most important kinds of bonds in biology. Covalent bonds overwhelmingly present, but hydrogen bonding also very important. Um, because they act like little magnets, as we already mentioned, with one end, if this is my water molecule, one end is slightly negative, the other end is slightly positive. It's like a little magnet. If another water molecule is nearby, as they often are, then the positive end, well, the negative end here, let me do that, and this positive end, this is going to be attracted to that because, of course, we know opposites attract. Okay, so water molecules will tend to want to kind of cling together like magnets like to cling together. Please remember they are not magnetized. This is due to electrical charge. It's just easy to talk about it in terms of magnets. Please do not write to me in a little free response about water being magnetic. It is not magnetic. It is due to electrical charge. Okay, um, so um, Wherever, and this is another important caveat, and we'll see this later on when we talk more about organic molecules, but if you ever have an OH group, and that means it, that's also called a hydroxyl group, we talked about it before when we talked about pH a little bit, if an OH is ever stuck onto a larger molecule, any kind of molecule, it will cause it to be polar for the same reasons it's polar in water. So it does, this hydrogen bonding doesn't necessarily just exist between water molecules. It can exist between all kinds of molecules. It's just easiest to talk about it in terms of water. Now, you should know this. Hydrogen bonds are really quite weak. They are nowhere near as strong as covalent bonds, but they are certainly stronger than having no bond present at all. So over here we are looking at two water molecules, and there's covalent bonds within this one water molecule and covalent bonds within this other molecule and those are very strong. Those hydrogens are not going to come apart from those oxygens. This is the hydrogen bond. Notice it's indicated by a dotted line to indicate it's not as strong as these. It's weak between the water molecules but it's stronger than nothing. Okay? Very profound. This weak little pitiful bond has enormous importance for life on Earth, okay? We already just mentioned this, covalent bonds are inside the water molecule itself, holding the hydrogens to the oxygen. Hydrogen bonds are between water molecules here, 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 okay? A bunch of water molecules would just be kind of clinging together. All right, now, how do these hydrogen bonds lead to water's important properties, okay? Make sure Okay. Um, why are we even studying water? I thought this was about living things. Water is not living. Well, of course, all of life occurs 
and water in aqueous solution, whether it is in the activities are inside of a cell or outside of a cell, there's going to be water somewhere around. Okay, and why is it water that is so everywhere in terms of life? Why isn't it some other substance? Why isn't it, I don't know, methane? I don't know. What's so special about water? Well, what is special about water is what we've already been talking about. It's polarity. Okay, um, We've already talked about uh, the creation of attraction. The slight negative charge at the oxygen end of one molecule is attracted to the slight positive charge at the hydrogen end of another molecule, and they're just slightly attracted to each other. You can think of the water molecules as being sort of sticky. They like to kind of stick to each other, as again, like magnets do. Okay, if this is your beaker of water, all those water molecules in there would be slightly attracted to each other, and they're all kind of clinging together, like uh, this this great picture shows. Okay, so there are seven properties that we generally talk about that are really important uh, for life on Earth dealing with water and this polarity of water is what is responsible for all seven of these properties. The first is cohesion and that simply means that water molecules like to stick to each other. Water likes to stick to itself if you will. So here's my, uh, let me do this way, uh, okay H2O H2O and these things are going to want to stick together. Now surface tension is a direct result of cohesion. Now this is perhaps a trivial example but it does illustrate it. This water strider can walk on the surface of this water because he is light enough and his feet are designed well enough that he does not break that surface tension, these polar attractions, these hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. Okay, uh, and we'll talk about other places where cohesion is important as well. But cohesion is water wanting to stick to water, where adhesion is the fact that water also likes to stick to other things as long as those other things are polar. Okay, so this is bonding, hydrogen bonding, weak bonding between water and other polar substances. The other substances do have to be polar. Now, uh, some really important properties of water, not that boundy paper towels are, are really important a biological concern, but capillary action that we see when um, these fibers attract a liquid and go up into the fibers of the paper towel. That's why we buy paper towels. That is capillary action. Water is being attracted to the fibers of the paper towel, which are polar, and they go right on up into the paper towel. Okay? When you see a meniscus and a graduated cylinder, okay, there's your graduated cylinder, and the it's not perfectly flat. Of course, the the water is clinging to the sides of the cylinder. Um, so there's your proper meniscus right there. Um, this plays a more important part. Adhesion and cohesion both play a really important role. Let me write this up here. Adhesion and even more importantly cohesion. Remember water sticking to itself, water sticking to other things that are polar in getting water from to the tops of trees. Okay, If you'll remember, uh, a tree is going to be collecting water from its roots. Water goes up the trunk and out through the leaves. It is because water will stick to the sides. This is as though you've taken the trunk and gone in cross sections. So you've sliced the tree, you've chopped it down, and you're looking at the trunk edge on. I mean, um, right at the, all the, you can see all the annual rings and whatnot. These are the little plumbing tubes that are carrying the water up the tree. Okay, And because the water likes to cling to the polar surfaces of these tubes, the xylem, which we'll talk about more later, um, and because water also likes to cling to itself, it will move itself on up and out through the leaf surfaces. This is pivotal. This is what makes transpiration 
transpiration work and we'll talk more about what that means but that's water loss through leaves but it's much more important than just that so we will definitely address this later but just be aware that cohesion and adhesion play a role in that now okay all right Water is a fantastic solvent as long as the things you are trying to dissolve are also polar. Remember these words, solvent is the thing that does the dissolving, solute is the thing that gets dissolved. If water is going to dissolve something, that solute has to be polar, otherwise water won't dissolve it. Okay. Now, how does this work? Okay. If uh, we wanted to dissolve some salt, we all know that salt dissolves in water. Why? Well, salt, if you'll recall, sodium chloride is ionically bound because the chlorine took the electron from the salt and left salt being positive, chlorine became negative, and now they're clinging to each other due to their opposite electrical charges. Well, those are electrical charges. We, uh, water molecules see these negative chlorines and get all excited about that, and they cling around them. The positive parts of the water molecules cling around them. Um, and the um, sodiums excite the other parts of the water, the negative oxygen parts of the water, okay, and they cling around the sodiums. And by doing so, they separate them and dissolve them. And water will do that to almost uh, any ionically bound substance and dissolve it. So if, as long as the substance is polar, then water will be an excellent solvent for it. These, when water comes around the chlorine like that or around the sodium, those are called hydration shells. They prevent the ions from coming together because they basically surround them and break them apart. So please remember these words, solvent, the dissolver, solute, and solution is the uniform mixture that you have as a result of dissolving one thing and another. Okay, um, so what dissolves in water? What dissolves in water are things that are hydrophilic, things that are attracted to water. Philic means to love, so water loving. Okay, water loving things are going to be which of these? Polar or nonpolar? Polar. Okay, if they're nonpolar, they're not going to be interested in water, and water would not be interested in them. Okay, um, all right. Water organizes nonpolar molecules. Now, wait a minute. I didn't think water was interested in things that were nonpolar. I just said that in the last slide. That's true. Um, but water is interested in itself. So if you put water in with some lipids, oils, fats, things that are nonpolar, if you've got oil and vinegar salad dressing, vinegar has got lots of water in it. Oil is a lipid. You shake it up, they separate. You know your oil and vinegar is going to separate, and you're going to have to shake it up again if you want to use it. Water will separate itself from nonpolar things because it's not interested in them because they don't have a charge. It doesn't like them. So molecules that lack polarity um, cannot attract water. Okay, They'll, The water will actually push those polar molecules out of the way and then um, it's almost as though, as, it, or, as, it, it, as though as it, it is organizing them, though that, that kind of ha happens as just an accidental result of this. This is important because of the way our cell membranes are made and all of life, all of life is based on membranes because that's the fundamental creation of, of separation of a cell from its outside environment to this living entity. So we will talk much more about cell membranes, but let's just suffice it to say now that these uh, this membrane would not be in this highly organized shape if it weren't for water being more attracted to itself than it is to any of these nonpolar parts of the cell membrane. Okay, um, so what things don't dissolve in water, what things can water not dissolve, things that are hydrophobic or water 
interfering, if you will, substances that are not attracted to water. And what we're talking about there is any type of lipid. And when we're talking about lipids, we're talking about fats and oils and waxes and so on. And we'll talk much more about those later. So things that are hydrophobic and do not attract water are nonpolar. OK? About hydrocarbons later. Remember that solid water floats. This is really important for life on Earth, um, and it's also very unusual. Um, usually, now let's remember when you cool s molecules down, they when initially if you have them at some warm temperature, they're moving randomly, very randomly all around, and if you s cool them they begin their movement slows down and they're not moving as much okay and because they're not moving as much they will slow down and pack together more and more tightly it's this wild movement that'll keep them separated and cause them if you really heat them up to be in the form of a gas so you chill them down they tend to pack more tightly together and water does that to a point but then if you chill it down to about four degrees it actually the molecules go poop and they just get a little bit further apart, causing solid water that is chilled below 4 degrees, so zero's freezing point, to be less dense than its liquid counterpart. Now, why is that? When the molecules get close enough together, it causes the hydrogen bonds that we've already talked about uh, between the water molecules to form something called a crystal lattice structure that separates the mo uh, molecules from each other and makes them slightly more separated than they are in the liquid form, and that makes the ice float. Okay, water is most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. Oddly, you get colder than that, and then these little bonds will not allow the molecules to pack any closer, and that's it. That's as close as they get. Okay, um, <clears throat> this has made all the difference as far as life in bodies of water in particular, but not just isolated to that. Um, ice floats, and that means that ice in a cold environment is going to float on top and thus create an insulating layer on top of the water so that this liquid water can exist below the icy surface and that means you can still have life that is not frozen solid over the winter um, so oceans and lakes don't freeze solid that's that's another thing if um, there weren't this uh, layer of ice that stayed on the top, if it sank, okay, the ice would freeze on top because the air would get cold. And then if it were more dense, it would just it would just sink to the bottom. And then slowly over time, more and more layers would sink and you would end up with this just frozen solid pond or lake or whatever, ocean. Um, that doesn't happen. So surface insulates the water below, allows life to survive, and the ice won't sink so that the pond, lake, oceans will not freeze solid. Okay. Um, also, this allows this um, seasonal upturning turnover of lakes, allows nutrients to rise to the top as the cold water on the top um, in the fall will sink to the bottom and then push that bottom water up and then allow the nutrients at the bottom to kind of rise up through the water column. Okay, um, but by far, in a way, I think the one that you most need to know is this up here. All right, specific heat. You need to be able to define this. Please, if you're going to throw the term, any term around, be able to define it. The amount of energy it takes to change the temperature of some substance, in this case water, by one degree Celsius. It takes a lot of energy to do that to water, to get one degree Celsius up. Water resists changes in temperature, has a very high specific heat. In other words, it means water, since it takes so much energy to heat it up, has actually a pretty stable temperature because it doesn't heat up very quickly. You've got to apply a lot of energy to do that. Um, why? Well, before, again, remember, what makes molecules, what makes us sense temperature, heat, 
is the movement of molecules, movement of molecules, kinetic energy. And the hotter we make, the more energy we apply, we feel these molecules bumping around into our skin, and we feel that as a temperature increase, OK? But before water molecules will do all this wild moving, we've got to break those little, tiny, weak hydrogen bonds that are have them all clinging together. And only then will they start that wild kinetic motion that we will sense is a rise in temperature, OK? Also, it has to lose a lot of energy before it will cool down. So once it's heated up, it takes it a while to cool down. Um, energy has to go into reforming those broken hydrogen bonds. So what this is the bottom line is that water really moderates temperatures on Earth. Water is the key um, component of our atmosphere, and not to mention the bodies of water that we have, that keeps our temperature relatively stable. It's hard to heat it up. And it's hard to cool it down, OK? Which is why this life-rich thing here versus this really barren thing here. We've got water here to moderate our temperatures, no water there to moderate um, temperature. Oh, and also water, of course, you, there's a ton of water in your own body. So water is moderating temperatures in your own body as well, um, again, trying to keep you from fluctuating wildly. Remember that term, homeostasis? The fact that you have so much water in your body kind of allows that to be a little bit more easily maintained than if it were some other chemical. Finally, heat of vaporization is pretty related to the specific heat. Um, mainly, again, please be able to define it. Don't just throw a term out without defining it. The amount of energy it takes to cause one gram of a liquid to become gas. So we're talking about how much energy does it take to evaporate um, from a liquid to a gas. And it takes a whole lot of energy to cause water to do this. That's important. For example, when you sweat, when you, water evaporates from your body surface, it takes a lot of heat energy with it, because it takes a lot of heat energy to cause it to vaporize. So therefore, you will feel cool as a result of that water leaving your body. So this is just showing you uh, what a high specific heat water has. Um, uh, 100 degrees Celsius, pretty high specific heat, OK? Um, evaporative cooling, you should know that word. That's essentially what allows us to cool off when we sweat or when animals pant. They are engaging in evaporative cooling, evaporating water from their bodies through their mouth. Okay? Um, so these are your properties of water and things that you can associate with them. You should know all of these properties and be able to give examples and definitions where required, uh, especially for these two terms and these terms up here as well. Um, but all of them, you ought to be able to toss around these terms and their definitions and, and examples uh, of how each of them plays a role in, in life. Okay? Um, and remember that all of these properties exist because water, hydrogen bonds with other water molecules, which happens because water is polar, and that happens because oxygen, not water, oxygen is electronegative. It loves electrons. So oxygen le being electronegative leads to that property of water. Okay, and that leads to hydrogen bonding, which leads to all the properties that we just talked about. Um, this is a talk about here pH, and I'm going to stop there, and because uh, we've already talked about pH when we talked about homeostasis, so I'm not going to talk about that again. And then I'll give you one more little podcast um, dealing with some basics about organic chemistry. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. See you at the next podcast.